Uh, thanks for joining us to the Pittsburgh <laughs> Participate Pennsylvania Voter Participation Trainings. I'm Chris Sandvig with the Pittsburgh Community Reinvestment Group. This is the first of our four fall online trainings that will take place each Wednesday in September from noon until 1.30 p.m. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of our project's partnering organizations, Keystone Progress, Education Fund, PCRG, Greater Pittsburgh Nonprofit Partnership, the Forbes Fund, Pennsylvania Association of Nonprofit Organizations, the National Urban League, Pittsburgh Black Official Coalition, Pittsburgh City Paper, the Pennsylvania Capital Star, and Public News Service. We're joined today by our cohorts, Allegheny County District 13 Representative Olivia Bennett, Councilwoman Bennett. Um, welcome and uh, thanks for uh, joining. Thank you, uh, Chris, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Councilwoman Olivia Bennett, or Liv Bennett, um, I go by Liv, from the Pittsburgh Black Elected yeah. Officials Coalition. Today's training focuses on sharing information on existing resources for nonpartisan voter participation work and covering the key dates you should know about leading up to the November 3rd general election. Featuring our guest trainers from the Pennsylvania's Department of State, Nonprofit Vote, and Business for America. Uh, as a reminder, if anyone has any questions for our trainers, please use the questions icon in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. We'll have approximately 20 minutes at the end of today's event to answer those questions. This session is being recorded and will be available at the Pittsburgh City Paper website at Pittsburgh C PGH City Paper. websites. So our first trainer is Stephen Latasha uh, I went over that pronunciation and I still butchered it. So sorry, Steve, but we're happy to welcome you as our first trainer. Um, Steve is the director of the Intergovernmental Affairs at the Pennsylvania Department of State. So take it away, Steve. Hey, thank you so much, Councilwoman, uh, and, and, and thank you to uh, Participate Pennsylvania for, for hosting this. Um, it's just a, a wonderful venue for, for us to ensure that, you know, all of our folks are, are educated and understanding all of their rights uh, going into the November election. Um, you know, uh, as, as Director of the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs, um, <laughs> we had an entire uh, engagement strategy planned uh, um, come about April. We threw that all out the window. So, uh, <laughs> while we're doing a ton of digital advertising um, uh, on just about every platform you can imagine, uh, uh, along with some TV and radio and print, as well as some postcards uh, y'all hopefully have begun receiving, um, uh, this is the single best way we can engage. So thank you. Um, today, we're going to be talking about how to register to vote. Um, we'll cover some important dates, uh, as well as uh, um, a variety of different scenarios uh, for folks who might not quite understand their rights or for um, uh, you folks in, in, in communities to help educate them. So, um, uh, Pat, everybody can see my screen. We're good to go. Awesome. We are. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, um, the question is, are you ready to vote in 2020? Uh, how to register to vote in Pennsylvania? Uh, you'll see at the bottom there, uh, votespa.com is uh, some of the largest text on the page. That is your trusted resource if you have questions uh, or if you want to register or um, uh, uh, sign up for a uh, mail-in uh, or absentee ballot, that's where you go. Uh, and we have our hashtags at the very bottom there, hashtag ready to vote PA, hashtag votes PA, and hashtag trusted info 2020. If you're looking for um, the best information, take a look at those hashtags. If you're sharing any of our information, we'd, we'd ask you to, to go ahead and echo those hashtags as well so folks know where to go. Um, so, first question here is, who can register to vote? Um, to register and vote, to register to vote in PA, let's see if I can move this, there we go. You must be a US citizen for at least 30 days prior to the next election, a resident of Pennsylvania, uh, and in your election district for at least 30 days before the next election, uh, at least 18 years old on or before the date of the next election. Um, uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, criminal conviction and voter registration because there have been a lot of questions about that. 
Um, so if you meet the qualifications in Pennsylvania, you may register to vote. Uh, if you are in a penal institution, which means uh, a federal institution, an SCI, uh, or a county institution, um, any of those. Uh, awaiting trial, but have not been convicted of a felony. Um, if you are in any of those institutions due to a conviction for a misdemeanor. Uh, if you've been released from a penal institution or a community confinement facility after completing your sentence for a felony conviction, uh, if you are on probation, released on parole, or are under house arrest. Um, uh, now, if you are in a penal institution, your residence for voter registration is the last place you register to vote before confinement uh, in that institution, be it county, state, or federal. Um, your address will be your last known address before confinement, uh, and uh, uh, either that or, or a new residence uh, that has been established while you are confined. Uh, penal institution or community confinement facility cannot be your residence address for registering to vote. Uh, you may use these locations for your mailing address, especially uh, if you are uh, currently incarcerated um, and, and, and looking to get uh, um, those materials uh, through the mail. So uh, moving on here to college students and voter registration. Now, if you're a college student who attends college in Pennsylvania, you may register to vote where you live while attending college in PA. Uh, you may only register to vote in one place uh, and that is sort of a, a long-standing rule statewide for everyone. <laughs> uh, when should you fill out a registration form? Uh, you can use the voter registration application uh, to register to vote, uh, to update the address on your voter record. Uh, so let's say you've moved uh, from your parents' house to a dorm uh, or from a dorm back to your parents' house. Um, to change your name on your voter record, uh, which is very important. <clears throat> Uh, or to change your political party. Um, uh, in Pennsylvania, you can register uh, as a, uh, a Democrat or Republican or an independent. Um, uh, you can register as, as many others, but for the primary purposes, we, we are still a closed primary state. Um, so uh, the voter registration process um, involves completing a voter registration application. Uh, the County Board of Elections will review and approve that application. And uh, if it's accepted, the County Board of Elections will issue a voter registration card via the mail. Uh, and that registration card will show uh, the voter's name, address, party affiliation, and their polling location. So um, the big piece here, how to actually register. Uh, the easiest way to do it, uh, if you have a computer, uh, is online at www.votespa.com uh, slash register. Uh, that's something that we uh, we put together. Uh, it was actually one of the very first priorities uh, of the governor um, coming in was to move our, our voter registration uh, to something that could be done online. Uh, that happened in 2015. It was a huge, huge um, advancement for the Commonwealth. Um, uh, and it allows us to have, you know, a little bit of bragging rights. Uh, New Jersey just just completed their their uh, online portal for uh, um, uh, online voter registration. So, you know, we can dust our shoulders off a little bit there. Um, you can also register by mail, which is the traditional way to do it. Um, and you can request a paper application by emailing the Department of State um, at the following uh, email address, which is ra-voterreg at pa.gov or by calling 1-877-868-3772. Uh, you can also register to vote uh, while you are getting your driver's license. All you need to do is check a box uh, uh, on any of PennDOT's uh, um, uh, applications and that will immediately get fed through to us and concurrently to your county so you can register to vote that way. Um, we're also working uh, on uh, creating a, a one-stop voter registration shop uh, across uh, other Commonwealth agencies. Um, you know, we, we, we very firmly believe that, you know, the, the very first responsibility of government is to ensure that, you know, citizens can, can take part in it. Uh, so whether you are coming directly to Department of State or you're registering for uh, your fishing license, we'd love for you to be able to have the opportunity to register. And we are working uh, on, on creating those 
those APIs uh, uh, to link to all other Commonwealth websites as well. Now for online registration, your registration link again uh, is available www.votespa.com backslash register. Um, as a, a you know, point of, of reference here, you, you, you do have to complete all the required fields in order for your registration to be processed. Uh, for the paper voter registration application, um, your application must be completed and submitted to your county board of elections. Um, that does not get fed uh, directly back to the Commonwealth. Eventually, it, it, it needs to go directly to your, uh, your county board of elections in order to be processed. Um, your application can be mailed uh, or it can be delivered in person. To request voter registration forms, contact the Department of State at ra-voterreg at pa.gov or 1-877-VOTES-PA, uh, which is 1-877-868-3772. Uh, so the NVRA is the National Voter Registration Act. Uh, I'm sure folks I'm, I'm speaking to today didn't need me to <laughs> uh, uh, outline that, but for anybody who might not know, uh, there are uh, other agencies uh, of the Commonwealth that are required uh, to undertake voter registration activities uh, through the National Voter Registration Act. Um, uh, many agencies must offer voter registration. Uh, it is mandated by the National Voter Registration Act. Um, uh, PennDOT is a perfect shining example of one of those agencies. Um, uh, now, uh, in order to complete your registration, um, what's required? I'm gonna move my floating panel over here so my face is not in the middle of my presentation. Um, your name, your address, your date of birth, uh, your PennDOT pen driver's license or uh, state ID number, or the last four digits of your social security number. If you don't have the first two, you can use the latter. And lastly, your signature. Uh, we are um, you know, in conversations with the legislature uh, on a whole host of issues. Uh, the signature, signature requirement is one, uh, but, but uh, as, as of right now, that, that is required uh, to complete your registration form. And we do not anticipate that changing uh, uh, at least this year. <laughs> uh, so your voter ID requirements. So when voting for the first time in your precinct, uh, you'll, be, you'll be required to show a form of identification. Uh, after, after the first time, you, you, you won't need to display. Um, so that identification can be either a photo ID or a non-photo ID. Uh, and there's a whole list of acceptable forms of identification um, uh, that you can use in lieu of a driver's license or state ID. Um, passport's another example. Um, uh, but there's a whole full list of them uh, at our website, and that is www.votespa.com backslash ID. So um, in terms of photo ID, a Pennsylvania driver's license or photo ID card will suffice. Um, any ID issued by any Commonwealth agency uh, or any ID issued by the U.S. government. Um, you know, a, a military ID card, again, your passport, um, and there's your passport uh, and U.S. Armed Forces ID, um, uh, both uh, um, usable in, in this scenario as well. Um, you can also use your student ID uh, if you're going to um, uh, any Pennsylvania uh, State University, uh, the PASHI system, Penn State, Temple, Pitt, um, uh, or, or, you know, a, a private school um, uh, individual student ID, uh, or your employee ID. So, a um, uh, list of some valid forms of non-photo ID. Um, any voter registration card issued by the county uh, voter registration office which we mentioned earlier, uh, after you have registered, the county will send you uh, a, a, a physical copy of your voter reg registration card, uh, and you may indeed use that uh, as a valid form of ID at your uh, polling place should you be voting in person there. Um, any non-photo ID issued by the United States government, um, 
any non-photo ID issued by any Commonwealth agency. Um, you may use uh, your firearm permit if you are uh, licensed to uh, carry firearms in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Bet you didn't know that. <laughs> uh, or uh, e even down to a current utility bill. Um, uh, my whole family is, is from the eastern side of the state, so we'll use PICO as an example, but um, you, you can bring in your, your, your PICO electric bill and, uh, uh, and, and, and utilize that as well. Um, a current bank statement uh, from your bank or credit union. Uh, or even your paycheck. All of these can be used uh, and are valid forms of non-photo IDs. Um, government check. Uh, let's say you've received uh, a check from the IRS that you for some reason have not processed yet. You can feel free to use that as well to vote. So uh, moving on here to uh, submitting the form. Uh, you'll want to mail your application. Uh, you can also deliver your application directly to the County Board of Elections office during normal business hours. Um, and you can find addresses for all Pennsylvania County Board of Elections offices listed on the second page of the paper voter registration application. You can also find them uh, uh, at votespa.com. Uh, we have them listed there as well. Uh, now, uh, just as a reminder here, uh, your voter registration is not complete until it is processed and accepted by your County Board of Elections office, um, uh, which is to say you can register online through us. We will send that immediately to the county, um, but uh, you're, you're going to get uh, an, an email notification when the county actually uh, processes and accepts that, uh, and that is when your, 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 uh, uh, your registration is valid. So, uh, voter registration deadline. Uh, that is 15 days before the election, thanks to um, Act 77 of 2019. Uh, prior to that point, um, the deadline was 30 days prior to an election. Uh, we, were, we were able to cut that in half uh, through a lot of hard work um, uh, from my colleagues, uh, Secretary Bookfar, the governor, uh, and uh, some great bipartisan agreement within the General Assembly. Which means that the voter registration deadline for the general election is Monday, October 19th, 2020. That is the deadline to register to vote ahead of the November election. And again, you can do it online or you can do it by paper. Um, also, fun facts uh, for me, uh, Monday, October 19th will be my very first wedding anniversary. So, you know, some significance there. <laughs> uh, the registrations sent by mail must be received in the county election office by 5 p.m. on the day of the deadline. I'm so happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hey, glad to hear it. Um, uh, there's there there is never uh, a uh, um, uh, an absence of activity here for us. But I'll tell you what, uh, the, uh, the the fourteen to eighteen hour days are definitely wearing. We're happy we're able to get that done. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, online registrations must be submitted by midnight on the day of the deadline. So paper is by five p.m. in the county elections office. Online registrations, if you are doing it through uh, votespa.com backslash register, those registrations must be completed, submitted uh, online by midnight on the day of the deadline. So um, important general election dates here. Um, you can see October 19th, the last day to register to vote for the general election. Um, we got a, a nice handy little uh, uh, URL there, registered.votesba.com, if you don't feel like doing it the other way around. Um, October 27th, the last day to apply for a mail-in or absentee ballot. Um, uh, very, very important. Um, and you can do that again at votesba.com backslash apply mail ballot. Uh, it takes two minutes. Um, and if you are on the permanent list, uh, you, you don't even need to do it. Um, uh, then uh, third down there, you'll see um, uh, the deadline is November 3rd, election day, uh, which is uh, the deadline for voted mail-in and absentee ballots to be received by the county at 8 p.m. Uh, 8 p.m. is also when polls close, um, just as a point of reference. So um, that, that is why all voted mail-in and absentee ballots uh, must be received by the county by 8 p.m. on election day. Um, and then you'll see the last uh, piece down there, very important. Um, uh, if, if you are uh, inclined to vote in person, 
Um, uh, we are working uh, with uh, the counties to ensure that there is plenty of PPE, um, social distancing, uh, and uh, to ensure that voting in person will certainly be safe for you. Uh, if you choose to do so, polls are open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, if you are in line by 8 p.m., you can continue to vote even if there's a line there. Uh, and you can find out more information at votespa.com backslash polls um, uh, for all of your uh, trusted election information. Needs. So um, the confirmation of voter registration here. Uh, if your registration is accepted, you will receive a voter registration card from your county via non-forwardable mail. Uh, again, that voter registration card can be used as a non-photo ID uh, if it's your first time voting in person there. Uh, if you do not receive that voter registration card within 10 days, please contact your County Board of Elections office. Uh, again, um, contact information uh, is available for every County Elections office uh, on votespa.com. Um, uh, so if you do run into any issues there and you need to reach out, please don't wait, reach out immediately. County election staff are very busy. Um, uh, preparing for, you know, an, an unprecedented uh, uh, way of, of conducting an election here. Uh, if your voter registration application is unable to be processed, you will receive a letter and you should, again, immediately contact your County Board of Elections office, um, uh, uh, you know, to rectify any additional information they may need that has prevented that uh, application from being able to be processed, uh, to fill out another one, or, or to get some more information for yourself. Um, for military and overseas citizens, uh, to register to vote, you can use any official voter registration form. Uh, you can register online or via mail. Uh, I have a good friend um, uh, uh, in Germany who, who just did, did just that uh, through our, uh, our, our online portal and was very appreciative of it. Um, you can use the federal postcard application. And uh, you can also request the Pennsylvania Department of State uh, mail you a paper registration form. Denial of registration. Uh, so this is so that folks are aware uh, um, of why counties can deny registration uh, forms. The County Voter Registration Office can deny a voter registration application if any information on the form is not valid, uh, if the information is incomplete or it's missing, uh, some examples include um, maybe you provided an invalid address. Uh, for instance, um, uh, you know, your, your, your apartment building, um, let's say you didn't specify the apartment number in there. Uh, while the first piece of, of, of that address is, is valid, you need to further specify in order for uh, the county to know uh, which, which apartment you're living in. Um, you fail to provide a date of birth. Uh, you do not sign the application. That's very important. Uh, um, we have, uh, uh, you know, many folks that, that just might forget to, to put their John or Jane Hancock, uh, their signature on uh, the bottom of the forms. It is very important that you do so um, uh, without the voter, um, uh, uh, the signature requirements, uh, counties will uh, deny your, 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 your voter registration application. Um, uh, or uh, you do not meet the qualifications to register to vote, which is to say, let's say you haven't lived in Pennsylvania um, uh, uh, for uh, 30 days prior to the election, um, uh, or you know, a variety of other issues. Um, voter registration status. Uh, so if you're not sure of your registration status, we have a handy tool that can take care of that for you. Uh, all you need to do is look up your information before you complete an application. Uh, and your voter status can be found at www.votespa.com backslash status. So uh, if you're not sure whether you're registered or not, before going and filling out a whole other uh, uh, form, you can, you can absolutely check the status of your registration. Um, so if you use the online application to register to vote, you can use your application number to track your voter registration application mm -hmm at www.votespa.com backslash app status. Uh, what that means is um, uh, you can actually, you can, you can track uh, your registration application through the entire process. Uh, we, we, we track it for you um, in real time. Um, uh, it's, it's, 
you know, I, I really wanted the, the, the format to be similar to like the Domino's pizza where you order online and, you know, you see the, uh, uh, the pizza move through the process. It doesn't look quite like that yet, but um, it's, it, it's very handy. <laughs> uh, you can also call your County Board of Elections office to ask about the status of your application. Uh, county contact information uh, is available at www.votespa.com backslash county. Um, and you can find, again, um, your addresses, uh, contact information, all sorts of stuff. So um, another really important piece uh, of our democratic process uh, involves poll workers. Uh, and um, I really have to give a hand to a lot of the organizations here on the call. Um, uh, coming up through Voter uh, 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 National Poll Worker Day, um, we've actually gotten over 20,000 applications uh, for poll workers, which is unprecedented uh, and wonderful. Um, uh, you know, if, if you want to serve as a cornerstone of democracy in your community, please sign up. Uh, thanks to Act 77 uh, and Act 12, we have also uh, increased uh, the amount of compensation uh, counties are, are available to give out for uh, poll workers. So um, you can you can uh, you can make some more money <laughs> uh, while serving your community and your democracy. Uh, so um, serving as a poll worker, your duties may include checking in voters, answering voters' questions, setting up and testing voting machines, uh, issuing ballots and other tasks uh, as assigned, um, helping fellow voters who encounter problems from registration issues to voter ID questions to language barriers. Um, I know uh, many counties are planning on having uh, some interpreters available. Um, uh, there, there is also a, a service, a translation service through the Commonwealth. If you call one eight seven seven votes PA, uh, you can also get some uh, uh, some translation services available there uh, over the phone. Um, helping fellow voters who encounter problems, um, uh, attend uh, attending training to learn the job duties ahead of the election. Um, you know, that, that has gotten more complicated for counties to hold, uh, but um, uh, counties are doing uh, virtual trainings and some in-person trainings as well, so the poll workers understand what their duties are and, and what's going to be expected of them on, on election day. Um, so how to sign up? Uh, you can check box 13 on the voter registration application. Uh, so you can do it while you're registering to vote uh, or as you're finishing. Um, you should include your phone number. Uh, an email address on the application so the county can contact you. Um, uh, if you uh, have already registered to vote but you are interested in serving uh, as a poll worker, you can complete our online poll worker interest form um, yeah. at the link below there. Can everybody please put their phones on mute, please? If you're not speaking, your phone should be on mute or your device should be on mute, please. I'm not sure if there's a administrator on here that can mute everybody. Thanks, Councilwoman. I'm sorry. No problem. <clears throat> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, push onward here. Um, uh, so again, uh, you can complete our online poll worker interest form, which is available uh, at the, the link below there. Um, and, uh, and, and as we've seen, we've had tens of thousands of people sign up that way. Uh, it's easy, it's painless. Uh, if you use the form, we send it directly to the counties uh, and then the counties will uh, reach out to you. <laughs> Lastly here, thank you. Thank you for uh, the time you've devoted uh, for, for me today. Uh, thank you for providing a forum uh, to educate voters uh, and community organizations, um, you know, the election's gonna be different this year. Uh, it was always gonna be different. Uh, we have some of the, the biggest changes to our, our voting law uh, in, in over 80 years, thanks to Act 77 of last year and Act 12 of, uh, of, of this March. Um, Pennsylvania has expanded access to the ballot um, uh, more in the last year than, than we have in the past 80. So uh, thanks again for your advocacy and, and, and your time today. Thank you so much, Steve. That was such a very comprehensive presentation. So we should have like everything available to us now to be able to be educated around registering to vote. So we thank you and I, I use votes, I call it vote spa because I'm a woman and I like relaxation. So what other way of remembering that than just making <laughs> a spa? So thanks so much. 
We're joined now by our next trainer, Caitlin Donnelly, Program Director at Nonprofit Vote, who will provide some additional resources for nonprofits and a preview of National Voter Registration Day opportunities. Take it away, Caitlin. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me today. Uh, it sounds like you just got a very thorough run through of voter registration um, processes and policies. So I want to shift gears towards what can those, you know, when you're doing those things, what can it look like for your organization? How can you make it a fun, uh, but also safe activity for you and the people you serve? So taking just one step back first, uh, yes, I am Caitlin with Nonprofit Vote. Our focus at uh, National Voter Registration Day, and I will share my screen, um, is uh, we really just work with nonprofits to make sure that you all have the tools you need to integrate voter registration and voter engagement activities into your existing services. Uh, our focus is on staying nonpartisan. Um, as 501c3 organizations, we must remain nonpartisan. Um, and so we're really one of the leading sites and resources for nonpartisan voter engagement information. Uh, we have lots of fact sheets on our website, uh, original research that demonstrates how effective nonprofits really are when they do start engaging people as voters. Uh, and a handy voting in your state portal uh, for all of those who do not have sites set up quite as well as Pennsylvania does. So I think it's always worthwhile to cover what it means to be nonpartisan as just a refresher or if you're not very familiar with this um, and it's your first time learning about how to stay nonpartisan. We have more resources on the website and I always recommend Boulder Advocacy, uh, spelled B-O-L-D-E-R, Boulder Advocacy, because they have a great hotline um, and resources on staying nonpartisan. Uh, but the basics for our 501c3s is that we can do voter engagement as long as we are not endorsing or opposing any candidate for office or, or any party. We're not ranking or rating candidates for office or in any way implying that a candidate or certain candidates are favorable. And lastly, we don't recommend that you're, you shouldn't be affiliating, uh, recommending that people affiliate with one party or another. So if you're doing voter registration, and they ask, oh, which party should I affiliate with? You should state that your organization is nonpartisan, that it's a nonpartisan drive, and that you know they can do some of their own research online or that they don't have to affiliate with a party at all if they don't want to. Uh, you also can't deny registration to anyone based on their political leanings or beliefs. Um, so anyone who is eligible to register, you need to help them with that process. Um, and as a helpful reminder, um, for a lot of us who have candidates that we support and love, um, that's great and we can support them on our own time. When we are doing voter registration on behalf of our organizations, we should leave the campaign buttons and any of that sort of swag at home um, and just really present as being a, a completely neutral uh, party uh, when doing any sort of voter registration or voter engagement activities more broadly. Um, so it's September and this is the most exciting time of the year uh, for all political nerds and junkies, um, especially those of us who care a lot about expanding access to voting. Uh, September is Voter Registration Month and the fourth Tuesday of September is National Voter Registration Day. Um, so you can sign up as a National Voter Registration Day partner. It is free and it's pretty easy to sign up. Um, and you can go to this link um, that I have on this slide, nationalvoterregistrationday.org partner. 
um, to sign up. Um, if you are a nonprofit organization, a business, a student group, all anyone can participate in NVRD. Um, and it's a really exciting and fun uh, day to get involved in. We have lots of resources on the NVRD website that can show you how to uh, set up either an in-person or a virtual event. There are social media graphics, uh, a communications toolkit, um, lots of other resources uh, that can really help you, you know, focus on interacting with voters and take some of the guesswork and the, you know, asset creation out of it. We, we have that all ready for you. Um, so National Voter Registration Day is a national holiday, uh, but there's also a group uh, in Pennsylvania working to engage nonprofits to reach out to voters. So if you would like to get involved with the PA Votes Initiative, you can email Kina Minifields. Um, so PA Votes is working, is uh, part of the Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania and working with Nonprofit Vote to reach as many voters as possible um, this year. Um, there's also a, a website, pa-votes.org, and that's a place where, in addition to checking registration status or applying for a vote by mail, they can also sign up for reminders. So if you want to sign up for reminders to see what it looks like, or if you want to encourage others to sign up to pledge to vote um, and get those reminders, you can use that site. So what does it look like, especially this year, to do a voter engagement or a voter registration event? You know, typically it's always been really in person you know setting up a table in a busy lobby um you know ho holding a fun event with maybe music and food obviously this year things are going to look a little different um and we're really looking to all our partners to use a mix of in-person and uh, virtual events to try to reach as many voters as possible. Um, we always have to be mindful that there is that digital divide. So, you know, as great as we can make our websites, you know, PA-votes or vote spa, I love that, vote spa. Um, there are people who do not have regular access to the internet, um, who people with disabilities who may struggle to uh, be able to use those sites. So it is nice if we can have some in person events. Of course, you'll want to do that, you know, along with the health and safety guidelines in your area, following CDC guidelines, ideally doing that kind of contact outdoors uh, with social distance with masks and other protective uh, personal protective equipment. Um, so one way that you can do this, and it can be distance, and we found that a lot of partners who have tried this have had great success, is to do a drive-through. Um, so, you know, there's lots of drive-through COVID testing, there's drive-through food drives, you can do a drive-through voter registration drive. Um, we do recommend that you um, sort of link it into a service or some some reason that people are already leaving their homes um, that will give you bigger crowds more engagement um, so if you can partner up with an organization um, that's offering a service or you have a service you'd like to offer uh, this works really well we've also seen it done um, you know shortly before like the vote by mail application deadlines um, over the spring during primary season so that People, you know, if, if the deadline for submitting a vote by mail application is that day, it's a good opportunity to just be like, it, it's now or never, if you want to vote by mail, fill this out and we'll turn it in for you or visit this link. Um, we have a whole guide on how to do a drive-through voter registration that helps you think through the volunteers you'll need, the setup, making sure it's clear flow of traffic and, um, you know, high visibility for people driving by, making sure that you have um, space for people who might come through by foot or on bike, uh, if you're in a, you know, heavily biked community. Um, so that resource is, I think, really invaluable and taken directly from the wisdom of organizers who have done 
vote uh, voter registration drive throughs. Um, and if you're going to do an event like that, uh, obviously it's going to be pretty open to the public. You'll want as many people as possible. So you can put it on the event map on nationalvoterregistrationday.org so that others in your community can find it and attend. Um, I also recommend using that event map because that's how a lot of the local media that reaches out to National Voter Registration Day and Nonprofit Vote asking, you know, we want to talk to someone in Pittsburgh or in Allentown about um, voter registration events on NVRD. We typically direct them to this map so they can get in contact with those people on the ground. If you are thinking, you know, for for me, my community, or the volunteers um, that I'm going to work with in person is just not an option. Uh, I recommend a good old fashioned phone tree. Um, this is another thing that's sort of coming back in light of COVID. Um, you know, some of us are emailed out, some of us might be getting Zoomed out, um, but people are still picking up their phones. So you can engage staff and volunteers by asking them to spend an hour of their day, you know, calling through a list of people that you serve. Now, if you don't have that kind of list and you don't have that, those phone numbers, uh, you can pivot and make it a relational organizing phone tree um, and ask people to reach out to five or 10, or maybe you have, it's a competition, a friendly competition to see who can reach out to the most people um, and have them reach out to their own contacts because research, research shows that relational organizing, when somebody's being contacted by somebody they personally know, that that's so much more effective than um, a cold call, um, a call from a campaign, et cetera. Um, if you're not zoomed out, you can host a virtual event. So um, maybe it'll be on Zoom or Facebook or Google Hangout, um, but you can show people how to register and apply for a mail-in ballot, you know, answering their questions, um, maybe doing a demo like with screen share where you're showing them the, the actual process, really making it very clear. Um, you can partner up with local leaders or elected officials to, you know, really make it a more exciting event. Um, you could also do something like screening a movie. Um, uh, All In um, is coming to Amazon Prime Video on September 18th, um, and that's all about, you know, voting rights and um, challenges to voting. So, you know, a, a movie could be a good way to get people involved. Um, and I want to bring up a really cool tool. Um, the Right Question Institute has this tool. It's called their Why Vote tool. And it's a great way to go even deeper with the people you serve and really have a, a very authentic um, and two-way conversation with folks because their tool um, has people first identify the government services that are most important to them so that they can make that connection between voting and their lives and then has them really formulate their own questions about the voting process. We always think about, um, you know, if you're in the sort of voting and electoral space, you know, we think like, oh, people need to know how to apply for vote by mail. Or they need to know when the deadlines are. But actually, there are questions like, what if I, what do I do if I make a mistake? Um, can I take my children with me to the polls? Um, questions like that, that you may never have thought of, um, but real questions that actually are barriers to, to people participating. Um, so that's a, a good way to, to go even deeper um, during your event. Uh, if you want to focus your effort, efforts a little more uh, leading up to September 22nd, um, ask your local government to pass a resolution recognizing September 22nd as National Voter Registration Day. Um, city councils, state legislatures, um, you know, pass a lot of these resolutions. Uh, it was passed last year in the Senate. Um, so Senator Klobuchar is a big proponent of National Voter Registration Day um, and each year 
you know, sponsors a bill to um, recognize National Voter Registration Day. So this is also a really good sort of media tool um, to get, you know, some more attention and focus so that, um, you know, wall to wall, the messaging is get registered on September 22nd. Um, and I believe in 2017, a bill was brought um, in the Pennsylvania House. I don't think it passed, but if you look that up, maybe that's a good template for language um, to bring to your city or local government. Very last thing, very easiest thing you can do if you do nothing else, uh, put it at the top of your newsletter that day with the link to check registration. Um, pin it at the top of your social media page. As I said before, we have lots of sample posts and graphics, so it can be really plug and play, very easy for you to do. Um, so if, even if it's just at the top of, of that newsletter, just you know, spreading the word. And of course, don't forget to um, engage with uh, your coworkers, your volunteers. Um, while we have a lot of focus on the people we serve, um, it can be surprising that not everyone who works for a nonprofit um, that is eligible to vote actually does vote. Um, and you know, fall is a big time where people are moving. Um, I live in the Boston area where there's so many colleges and like September 1st, it's like half the city turns over. So it's really good to put out the word that you've got to update your voter registration, even for the folks that you think might be on top of it. So I just want to go over a couple of uh, frequently asked questions we get about National Voter Registration Day. So the first thing people ask us is, how nonpartisan is it really? And it's completely nonpartisan. It's got support from both sides of the aisles, uh, the National Association of Secretaries of State and the National Association of State Election Directors uh, both endorse the day. Um, we've got sponsors from all different kinds of corporations, different nonprofits from YMCA to Feeding America. Um, it's, it really is like a, you know, inclusive, holiday. Uh, we also have a lot of partners focusing on um, the disability community, Asian American Pacific Islanders, uh, Latino and Hispanic voters, Black voters, uh, LGBTQ voters, so uh, faith voters, so like everyone. We're really trying to bring everyone in on this day um, and uh, part of the uh, agreement that our partner signed is that they will remain nonpartisan. Um, and so on the day of and leading up to it, not National Voter Registration Day is never lifting up partisan messaging, issue based messaging. It's really just we want to make sure you're registered because if you're not registered, you can't vote. Um, people ask, do events have to be held on Tuesday, September 22nd? What about other days? Um, for reasons it doesn't, I won't even get into. We do have it as a day rather than a week, um, but if we understand if you know a Tuesday is not the best day for you, uh, especially for a lot of faith communities um, or groups that just you know a Wednesday or a Saturday or a, just some other day of the week is really when they can um, you know harness the most energy and reach the most people. That's that's fine with us. Uh, we hope you'll still, you know, maybe tweet something on National Voter Registration Day or, or wear a sticker. Um, but if you hold an event, you know, a week within a week before or after uh, September 22nd, feel free to use the materials um, and report your, your efforts and um, your successes um, in the survey that gets sent to all NVRD partners. Um, we use that survey to really calculate our uh, reach on that day. Um, in 2018, we broke records and we had 865,000 people register. Uh, last year was a record for an off year with over 600,000 people. Uh, so we really need everyone to use that survey to report their results so that we can say that this was yet another record breaking year. Uh, people want to know who else is participating. 
So there's a partners page on the site and every few days we update it with a list of all the partners um, who have signed up. Right now, I just pulled the list. There's 181 partners signed up in Pennsylvania. Um, and I can actually share that list. Um, we don't, you know, share people's contact information when they sign up as partners, but we do have, uh, I do have a list that has the organization name and where they're located. Um, if you're curious to see um, which of your pals are already on board or who is it that you need to poke and prod a little uh, to join up. Lastly, does do, do things end with National Voter Registration Day? Absolutely not. There are other weeks and activities you can participate in, such as National Voter Education Week. That will be the first full week of October, really focused on making sure uh, folks know what's on their ballot, how they plan to vote, and feel really ready and educated about the process. And then September, uh, sorry, October 24th is Vote Early Day. Um, just encouraging everyone to, you know, mail in those ballots. Um, they should have already applied for it if they're applying, but mail those ballots in. Go um, in person if, uh, you know, early if people want to vote in person um, and just really, you know, try to get everyone, uh, you know, participating on that day as well. So that really covers um, the content I wanted to share with you all. Uh, this is my email address, Caitlin at nonprofitvote.org. If you uh, have questions or could use support um, around your efforts, um, you know, I know Pennsylvania is getting a lot of attention this year um, from campaigns, from outside groups, but it's really you, the folks that are on the ground, that are with the community, in the community, long before and long after election day that have the most trust, the deepest reach, and can really engage the people that those traditional methods just tend to look over. So thank you for being part of this um, effort and this presentation and good luck to everyone registering voters. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, again, a lot of information. Uh, my my other hat is a hat that I wear working for a nonprofit. So um, that is so useful to um, walk through what nonprofits and, um, can do and how they can participate in making sure we are not leaving any stone unturned in getting folks out here to vote. Uh, so thanks so much. Um, we're joined by our next trainer, Joe Petrucci. Petrucci? I hope I didn't butcher that. Um, Pennsylvania State Director at Business for America will update us on Operation Vote Safe and Ready to Vote PA. Uh, hey, Joe, can you take it away? I sure can. I sure can. Thank you. Uh, and uh, that was definitely close enough <laughs> in the right ballpark. I'm really happy to be, uh, be with you guys today. Can you, see, uh, can you see my screen okay? Yes, I can. Okay, it's thank not you. in presentation mode, but we can see it. Okay, let me uh, get it over in presentation mode for you. There we go. That's better? Better, Great. yes. Excellent. Uh, so, um, just wanted to share with you today. First, thank you to, uh, to Stephen and Caitlin uh, for so thoroughly covering uh, how to register to vote and vote in Pennsylvania. Uh, surely more important than ever to, to be paying attention to those things. Um, I'm the Pennsylvania State Director uh, for Business for America. And uh, Business for America is a national organization uh, working in several states, including Pennsylvania. And we're the only nonprofit uh, mobilizing businesses across the country around civic engagement initiatives and policy advocacy, all engineered to strengthen our democracy. So, um, you know, my hope today is to, to really share with you um, how, how we can all activate the businesses in the communities uh, that we serve. Uh, and there's, uh, you know, 
what we're finding on the ground is that um, this is a kind of role that business is not accustomed to playing. And it's, there's a lot of opportunity, uh, particularly in times when we have urgent needs across the state uh, among election officials and among uh, groups of disenfranchised voters. Uh, it's more important than ever uh, for these businesses to play a role in, in our civic health. Um, so, you know, we have a, a nonpartisan network of, of, we call them purpose-driven uh, companies and business leaders. They include uh, major corporations and brands uh, nationally like Patagonia, uh, Unilever, and, and Warby Parker. Uh, they're all advocating uh, for safe, secure, accessible elections and a number of other bipartisan uh, structural political reforms. Um, our work is most mature in Pennsylvania, uh, where we've been working since last year uh, as the business voice of the nonpartisan Keystone Votes Coalition. And our work is funded uh, in part by a grant uh, from uh, the Heinz Endowment. Um, so we know from research that, or that, uh, that polarization and hyperpartisanship are the number one obstacles to a well-functioning political system. There's a Harvard Business Re Review uh, uh, study that's been updated several times in the last few years that talks extensively about that. Our organization uh, operates on the premise that we need our politics to function in the same way communities need clean water uh, and safe roads. Um, our work is a different kind of corporate interest in politics. It's not about which candidate is right or choosing sides. Um, and there's really never been a better or more important time uh, to get involved. Um, so, um, you know, there's a growing mountain of research that demonstrates uh, a clear mandate for this kind of corporate civic engagement as customers and employees alike now expect companies you know, to play a role in their ability to vote safely and be a force for change in the face of injustice. There's also a healthy ROI for our brand of corporate civic responsibility. And I'd like to share some of those numbers uh, with you. Um, didn't include this on the slide, but you know, it's important to know that people nowadays are 50% more likely to trust a business more than the government or media. You know, 92% of consumers now agree it's important that companies take positions on issues that are in line with their values as a company. A full 81% of consumers say they would prefer to buy from companies that support democracy. Uh, and you know, when it comes down to issues like employee retention, employees are nearly 60% more likely to want to work for their current employer a year from now if that employer plays a role in ensuring that they can get to the polls on election day. So the way Business for America taps into this is by making civic engagement accessible to companies of all sizes and stripes. Um, and that includes programs like, uh, you know, the national nonpartisan and business led initiative called Time to Vote. Time to Vote uh, was started a few years ago by Patagonia and, and, and you know, endorsed by some other major brands like J.P. Morgan Chase and Walmart. Um, it's, it's a really simple nonpartisan initiative, takes less than five minutes to sign up for. Um, companies only need to make a plan to ensure that their employees get to the polls on election day. Usually that's via paid time off or, or planned time off, or sometimes having somebody like me or Steve or Caitlin come in and talk about um, things like voter registration day or um, you know, mail-in ballots because they're new in Pennsylvania this year. So regarding this year's elections, there was already a learning curve in PA thanks to last year's historic bipartisan legislation known as Act 77, which uh, Stephen talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, that updated the election code here in the state for the first time in some 80 years, uh, which has been great. The COVID-19 pandemic, however, has complicated things, of course. Um, that's not the only issue, you know, uh, you know, we have a, a pandemic of racial injustice uh, that's been burning for a long time. Uh, there is uh, also disinformation around vote by mail, confusion around the Postal Service uh, coming out of Washington, D.C. Um, these factors are all conspiring to create uh, an election season full of chaos. Um, the fact is, you know, most states election systems, including Pennsylvania, will be strained beyond capacity. Why? It was massive increases in absentee voters because of COVID. It's combined with high voter turnout. We're expect, you know, because of the, the, the nature of this election, we're ex anticipating uh, voter turnout that will dwarf uh, what we saw in, in 2018. 
there's a shortage of poll workers. We've talked about that. There's been a lot of progress, but there's certainly pockets of the state right now that are still struggling to replace uh, the, the folks who usually serve as poll workers. We know they're older uh, 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 voters typically, and uh, they are not signing up uh, because of the health concerns around COVID and their folks in their age range. And th there is a need for uh, younger uh, professionals to step up and, and, and play a role. Um, I just, uh, as an aside, I worked the polls for the first time myself in June um, and here in Delaware County. And it was a, an eye-opening experience. I'm a former journalist. I, I like, uh, you know, the adrenaline of, of the news cycle and, and you know, uh, live events. And I can tell you um, that, you know, that 14 hour shift that we pulled that day, uh, we, we served, you know, it was a lot of customer service functions, a lot of entrepreneurial kind of thinking to assemble those, those, uh, those, uh, you know, those voting uh, booths, uh, you know, those uh, portable voting booths. And it, it, it's, there's a lot of decisions that are made on the fly where we need people who can make good decisions and, and want to serve our, our voters uh, the best way, you know, the best way we know how. And, um, I, I can tell you that there are still needs uh, in pockets of the state uh, as well. So uh, there's also, you know, insufficient resources really for mail-in ballot processing and safe in-person polls. Uh, you know, when we talk about mail-in ballot processing, we know uh, in, in June uh, uh, that nearly 2 million mail ballots were processed, some 17 times what had previously been uh, processed uh, across the state. So we know that counties are doing their very best to keep up with the demand for, for mail ballots. Uh, however, you know, we saw here in Philadelphia uh, in June, um, three, four, five, six days after the election, there was a webcam on the county office. Folks were still counting ballots and uh, we're used to getting results, um, you know, that night. And uh, that might be something uh, where we're waiting a day, two, three days um, for election results. And I think you know, everybody wants to avoid that. Everybody wants to avoid holding up the works or, you know, every, no county wants to be known as having that, you know, that hanging chat or, 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 or you know, the, holding up the results. So, um, you know, we, I, I, you know, our business coalition it, it will say it, you know, they don't want to know uh, what's going to happen as a result of a disputed election that we, we, we don't want to go there. We've had enough uncertainty um, and enough uh, surprise this year already. So, we know in Pennsylvania, thanks uh, to a, an, an ideologically diverse study on election costs during COVID, uh, produced in part by the folks at Pitt Cyber, there's a $70 million election prepared in a shortfall in Pennsylvania. We also know that there's little chance of Congress getting any more funding to states and local governments around election preparedness. And we know that counties are also struggling from the initial round of funding and, and accessing those funds and, and, and making those funds available for election preparedness. So, you know, election officials are, you know, the way it's been put to us are, are, are looking under couch cushions. They are scrambling for any help that they can get for PPE, for scanners, for pens, looking for uh, potential facilities for, for early, you know, early voting or satellite voting centers. And we know businesses care about the health of their employees and they don't wanna risk, as I said, the potential fallout uh, from a disputed election. So enter Operation Vote Safe. Operation Vote Safe is, is something that Business for America put together in partnership uh, with the PA Department of State. We're mobilizing a national network of civic-minded businesses to support election administration in communities and across the country. Operation Vote Safe connects the needs of local election officials with the resources of the business community. And you know, right now, what we know uh, in, in working with the Department of State, we have a spreadsheet, 67 counties, what kind of PPE we need across several categories, uh, face masks, sh face shields, sneeze guards, gloves, hand sanitizer, disinfectant spray. Um, all of those items are in demand specifically, and we'll, I'll probably mention this five times before I stop talking, but sneeze guards are, are, are an urgent need across the state. Masks are still urgently needed. Uh, things like pens, with something on the order of three to four million pens across the state, so everybody has their own pen to fill out their paper ballot if that's what they're using. Um, there's a tremendous amount of need across the state. The Department of State is working with Pima to fill much of the needs, but there will still be major gaps 
uh, across the board. And that's why we need the business community uh, to step up. We, we need businesses to, to, you know, to demonstrate that we need poll workers. Uh, and and we, we need uh, businesses to step up and demonstrate uh, the education and awareness. So uh, around these issues, and, and we need them to be able to communicate how to vote and, and, and how to register to vote and when to get your mail-in ballot uh, submitted. So right now, um, as I mentioned, sneeze guards, masks, hand sanitizer, pens, floor tape, uh, paper towels, there will be more needs. Um, and um, we'll continue to work uh, with our contacts at the Department of State to, uh, you know, to assess those needs and, and connect uh, with counties. You know, for example, right now in, Pat uh, in Pittsburgh, Patagonia uh, has a you know, big store on Walnut there and uh, they are uh, donating uh, face masks. Uh, they're looking to donate their store in any way they can for Dropbox uh, location or as a, as a, uh, 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 satellite boating center. Um, and that's just one example, you know, across the state, we have companies purchasing PPE on behalf of counties. We have companies uh, contributing food uh, to poll workers uh, in, in several counties. And uh, the, the urgency is, is, is incredible. And I think companies now that, you know, we're beyond Labor Day, uh, companies now are really starting to lean into this and they're seeing, you know, we're seeing across the board companies do amazing things, right? You know, uh, how long has have folks been trying to get the Washington football team to change their name? FedEx gets involved and it happens seemingly overnight. Um, we, we've seen the power of business uh, stepping up um, time and time again uh, in, these, in these recent months. Um, I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, uh, the educational uh, component uh, to all this. And this is something uh, that piggybacks a little bit of, off of what Steve talked about earlier. And it's this Ready to Vote campaign. So we've taken uh, the Department of State's amazing work around Ready to Vote, and we've uh, sort of uh, business sized it and, and, and made it available uh, to businesses via a separate toolkit that includes a guide and that outlines the very same reasons and the very same business case that I talked to you about today uh, for why businesses need to play this, this kind of role. And also, also outline, you know, with very up to date, you know, this is for many of us, this is a moving target and it has been uh, since uh, the beginning of, of, of COVID. And, um, you know, it's important for, for businesses to be able to recognize that they, they have a role to play in educating uh, their employees here. And this toolkit is, is a very simple way, especially considering businesses are communicating more than ever now with employees with customers, around issues of safety, around logistics, around, uh, you know, changes into policy. So uh, businesses are, the, are, are great messengers. We know that already. And there's a real opportunity for them to take this toolkit and, and, and get this, this information in the hands of their, not only their employees, but also uh, when appropriate, uh, you know, their, their customers. Um, so, uh, we're holding a series of webinars uh, uh, across the state. Uh, we're doing one in Pittsburgh uh, on Friday. Um, uh, and uh, uh, you could very easy to find if you just go on Eventbrite and uh, look up uh, Ready to Vote Pittsburgh, it uh, should pop right up. And I uh, would love to have uh, as many folks on there as possible to hear more about uh, more from business leaders and as well as some of our elected officials, um, you know, why this work is uh, so important. We're also working uh, with a group in Pittsburgh called One Hood Media. We're working with One Hood on a program statewide where we're taking Ready to Vote and we're taking the digital toolkit and we're creating uh, signage uh, for in-person messaging at high traffic stores and communities of color. Uh, 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 Caitlin uh, touched upon it earlier, uh, canvassing and door-to-door -door and voter reg work looks a lot different this year. And in communities of color, it's a lot harder to get out the word on these election changes. We also know that in communities of color, there is a, the vote by mail or mail balloting is used far less. There's a distrust uh, in this community around voting by mail. And that's a serious issue when we're touting voting by mail as a safe way to vote in, in, in 2020. So uh, we need to make sure that communities of color are prepared to vote no matter what, that we're able to support them uh, to avoid some of the issues we saw in the June primary. You know, uh, the Penn Hills Library consolidated some 50 polling places down to one. There were lines, you know, credible lines, two hours long. Um, in Philadelphia, we had similar issues where, and especially in communities of color where people were voting 
uh, in the shadow of armed guardsmen, the National Guardsmen. Uh, and, and these are not the kinds of conditions uh, that, that we want to conduct our elections in. And, and, and that's something that we can all start to play a role in through the business community um, by, by helping get signage in these high traffic stores like bodegas, like salons and, and, and barber shops, like rec centers and other food service establishments that we're working on targeting uh, with, our, with our advocacy partners. And if, if there's any other advocacy groups uh, you know, working in those communities that would like to be a part of this, please, uh, you know, please do reach out to me uh, because we're looking to, to reach as many uh, brick and mortar businesses in those communities as possible. Um, so really quickly, you know, we're, we're encouraging, um, you know, we just kind of revised our, our own guidance uh, in the last couple of weeks based on some of the news out of DC. And, um, you know, I just want to start by, you know, prefacing this, you know, uh, voting by mail uh, is not uh, a partisan issue at the state and local level. Uh, it is a partisan issue at the national level. And how do I know this? If you go on the Republican uh, Pennsylvania page, if you go on the Democrats uh, state Pennsylvania page, both of those groups are encouraging their voters, their registered voters to vote by mail and to vote safe. Uh, I've talked to, you know, uh, Caitlin, to some of the same secretaries of state that you guys are working with, you know, I, namely Kim Wyman out of Washington State, a Republican who is all in on vote by mail and, and as, you know, has worked with us uh, to help uh, do similar uh, uh, work in, in Washington State. So we know that vote by mail is not a partisan issue at the state and local level where elections are run. So really quickly, just running, running through this, you know, We've got, we've got to get people to make a plan. And that means know your status, okay? Are you registered to vote? When you applied for a mail ballot, did you check the box to automatically receive one for the November 3rd election? And you know, look back on, on all the information Steve provided. It all goes back to votespa.com. You can check that all out there. Know your county. Is your county election office open? And has your county established drop box locations or satellite voting center? Again, go to votespa.com. Know your schedule. How busy are you weeks leading up to the general election on November or on November 3rd? Do you have space to make a trip to the county election office? My wife received her mail ballot in Delaware County about two days before the election. So she had to figure out to make a trip uh, maybe 30 minutes away to the, the county election office uh, and, and get that done. But it wasn't easy with, you know, two kids and juggling everything else that, you know, that we're juggling. So taking the time to, yeah, think about how much time we have is, is, is really important. And then finally, know your plan. Commit to a plan right now. How are you going to vote? And, you know, the ways we cast our ballot, there's basically four choices. Apply for a mail-in ballot, excuse me, apply for a mail-in ballot um, and drop it in the mail. Complete it, drop it in the mail. Or you can apply for a mail-in ballot and drop it at your county election office or uh, any county uh, drop boxes that are available. Uh, you can also, uh, you know, if, if your county election office is open, you can cast your ballot early in person by going to your county election office, applying for a no excuse absentee ballot, completing it and handing it back to the clerk uh, in, in that same one stop transaction. And that's going to be largely dependent on um, what's going on in your county election office. But that's a new option in Pennsylvania. It was not talked about much in June because of the, the state of election offices across the state. Uh, but it's something that we're talking about now because it, anything, anytime we can vote early or vote by mail, will ease the burden um, on in-person polling uh, on election day. And then finally, uh, you know, vote in person on election day. If that's your choice, it's very important to uh, to make a plan and to make sure you allow for extra time, at least two hours and get there as early as possible. Really quickly, uh, if you have a chance to talk with a business, uh, if there's a business that supports your work, let them know we need businesses to do three things around our election. Give employees time, to, uh, time off to vote, number one. Make it a priority. It's easy to do. It doesn't take any time. And if you don't offer paid time off, it doesn't have to come out of your, you know, come out of your bottom line. Uh, to support local election officials, however they need. The election officials are, as you know, as we've said time and time again, they're working incredibly hard 
to make this thing work and to make new voting rules work in addition to everything else. So they need our support, whether it's funding, whether it's goods, or whether it's doing, uh, you know, making DIY sneeze guards in your office, uh, because that's what you can do. It'll make a difference and no, no kind of, no donation will, will go uh, unappreciated. And then finally, make democracy a priority, either, you know, getting involved with something that Caitlin's doing on voter registration day, getting involved with what we're doing at BFA. There's, you know, I'm new to the political advocacy space. I'm a former journalist, but I have to say I'm struck by the number of groups working on the ground around these issues. It, uh, it makes me feel like, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're headed in the right direction. And uh, the more we can have the business community support these groups and shine a light on the work they're doing, uh, the closer we're going to get to really having a situation here where, where our, our representative democracy works for all. So um, thank you for your time today. Uh, I hope you'll encourage, uh, you know, any businesses that you're working with to uh, take a look at this, uh, this information and uh, leave you with some, um, some uh, websites and emails to check out here on the, uh, on the way out the door. But thank you and look forward to any questions. Thanks so much, Joe, for that uh, really comprehensive presentation on how businesses can be involved. It's really great. Um, recently, I saw that Old Navy is encouraging their workers to go work polls, and they're paying them to do so. So absolutely, I agree that every sector has a place and, and responsibility to make sure that we have as many folks out here as possible and exercising their civic right to vote. Uh, so now I'm joined by Hannah Lockhoff, GPNP program manager, and, and um, we, we will start taking your questions. Now, I did um, share earlier that questions could be submitted by uh, hitting the question icon at the bottom of the screen. Unfortunately, um, that is not available and the chat is not either. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask you, um, if you go to the participants tab, you'll see a function there that says raise hand. If you could raise your hand um, to let us know you have a question, we can definitely call on you and make sure that your question is heard and answered. Um, so well, um, so sorry, but I, I kind of skipped over welcoming Hannah. So Hannah, welcome and Thanks. I look forward to doing this portion of this of the session with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so thanks to everyone from, you know, Joe to Steven to Caitlin for their presentations um, and Liv for your lovely transitions. Just to get folks started, um, Chris and I took the liberty of drafting a couple questions, but yes, please. Anyone who raises their hand uh, will happy to give you, let you unmute and then ask your question. Um, to kick it off, um, you know, Chris and I were deliberating about timing um, regarding mailing in ballots. I mean, we know this was a concern in the spring. And so I wanted to ask a question to um, Stephen about, you know, the timing of mailing in a ballot, for example, if you apply for, you know, a mail-in ballot on the 27th, is it, you know, reasonable to expect that you'll get one before November 3rd? Um, and are there any kinds of ways in which we could proactively help folks um, apply earlier or even support that infrastructure for getting ballots to people on time? So thank you. That, that's an excellent question, Hannah. Um, what, what, what I will share, I mean, as, as, as Joe uh, intimated uh, and, and, and Caitlin intimated earlier, counties are extraordinarily busy. Uh, they have uh, an absolutely unprecedented number of uh, mail-in and absentee ballot requests. Um, what I would recommend for folks uh, is to apply immediately. Apply as soon as possible. Um, uh, more populous counties uh, like Allegheny, like Philadelphia, like Delaware, um, it is going to take them longer to fulfill these requests. Um, I would say once you receive uh, your ballot back, and you should receive it with, within about two weeks, but, but please don't quote me on that because county timelines are going to vary. They are absolutely going to vary. Don't hold them to a two-week timeline because it might not be realistic for them. 
as soon as, as, as voters receive their ballots uh, in the mail, I would fill them out and return them immediately. Um, uh, just, they're, they're just, there just really isn't a lot of, um, uh, uh, it, 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 it's not a smart move to sort of let things hang uh, this year. Um, you should get those materials uh, and then return them as soon as possible. Uh, whether that is dropping them off uh, physically at the county elections office, as uh, Joe mentioned uh, his wife did, um, or putting it immediately back in the mail. I would say, um, so long as you can drop your, uh, your ballots back in the mail uh, by, you know, uh, beginning of October um, uh, to maybe the, the, the second week in October, um, you, you should be fine. Um, uh, but if you, if you have any concerns or questions at all, just take that ballot and return it immediately to your, your uh, county elections office or a drop box that they or we designate um, uh, immediately. Uh, another thing that, that I will, uh, I'll share with you, uh, you can apply for a mail-in uh, uh, or absentee ballot in person at your county elections office. Uh, you can then fill that ballot out um, in person right there and immediately submit it. Um, we're not, you know, we, we, we don't call that early voting per se, um, but it is you filling out a, a ballot early and submitting it early so that your vote uh, can be counted immediately on election day. Um, so I, I, I know that was a bit of a long-winded answer. Um, that there isn't really a, a hard and fast uh, response here um, because this is unprecedented uh, and the stresses that county elections offices as well as the state are under are unprecedented. So please, um, in order to help those county elections offices out, do everything as promptly as possible. You know, I appreciate that, Steve. And I also want to link it to, to what Joe had mentioned about, you know, the, biz, the work that Business for America is doing, connecting, you know, the needs and maybe some gaps that might exist at the county level um, with the resources of businesses, uh, which is ingenious. And so glad that that work is happening. I'm wondering, you know, we often think about nonprofits um, working on the, you know, voter registration end, which is why we're all here. But um, are there any ways, you know, maybe uh, either Liv or Joe can speak to this as well, that nonprofits can help in that infrastructure and um, to help facilitate more of a smooth uh, voting process this time, whether it's in terms of, you know, the applications itself or say even materials or personnel that might be needed like the day of or that week? Um, so, Number one, I'll, I'll, I'm going to turn this over to Joe and Caitlin because they've both already spoken at length um, about the incredible work that they're doing. Uh, but just this forum right here is another incredible example of nonprofits helping um, to educate uh, and spread the word. Because my office, I can't tell you how many in-person events that I had planned for uh, um, you know Commonwealth personnel and myself to go out uh, and, and teach. That can't happen right now, and nonprofits are already filling uh, uh, those gaps. So, uh, Joe, Caitlin, I'll turn it over to you. But yeah, I would say um, just really consistent messaging around um, faith in the elections office and the electoral system, um, you know, reminders uh, to fill things out in a timely way. And if you are running a voter registration drive or helping people fill out those mail ballot applications, definitely doing some QC quality control uh, before those forms are turned in. Um, we collect a lot of just like pledge to vote cards physically, or at least we used to in the past. And I've looked at them and sometimes it's really hard to read those names or addresses. Um, and I used to, I was like a teacher for a little while, so I'm good at handwriting. So really try to make it very legible, very complete. Um, that helps both the voter and the elections office. So though, those would be my main suggestions. Yep, and uh, I would echo to yeah the need you know the real need. You know, I, I think um, uh, 
the, the very best of, of, of the, the sector, right? You know, the energy, um, watchful eyes, you know, uh, uh, not everybody could be a poll worker, but there's a lot of need for poll watchers. In, in a normal year, we have plenty of poll workers. Maybe we'd need some poll watchers. <laughs> now we really need the poll workers. So who's going to poll watch, right? So there's, you know, there's, there's a need for, we, we even talk about that. But I think, you know, establish a relationship with your, with your county election office. Uh, uh, talk about uh, what your uh, advisory board members are doing to support the election. You know, make it a conversation uh, internally and, and the, the workers and, and people who are involved in, in your organization, make sure that they have, uh, make sure that they have the time to vote and make sure that they're able to get to the polls. And, and you know, that messaging is, is really important, that constant drumbeat. And, and to Caitlin's point, yeah, staying positive. We do need uh, to have faith in our county election officials um, across the board. And, you know, despite a few, uh, you know, a few issues across the state, voting mostly went smooth on June 2nd, you know, for the most part. There were surely issues, but I think we need to come back to that and honor that and say, hey, we can, we can even do better when, you know, when the lights are really on uh, on November 3rd. Thanks so much. Um, oh, I'll let Liv and Chris uh, take over Q&A and extend it as well so we can let folks have a chance to ask questions. Yes, so thanks so much, Hannah. Um, and so, Steve, I wanted to come back to you because um, I jotted this down. And I, and I know it doesn't really um, apply in the general election, but you used a term that I really wanted you to expand upon and, and really define for folks, especially for folks who are new to voting and the registration process. Um, the reason why I want you to expand on it is because I myself personally had two folks that called me during the primary, like, I can't vote. And I'm like, so what are you registered as? And they're like, independent. well, that's why you can't vote. So can you explain the closed voting system during the primary, what that exactly means? Sure, Councilwoman. Um, so in, in, in Pennsylvania, um, we are, uh, we, we, we are uh, in a very old state, uh, one of the original states, uh, and, um, uh, you know, machine politics was very much a, a part of Pennsylvania's past. Um, uh, uh, in, in part, um, uh, what a closed primary system means is that uh, you can only vote uh, for Democratic or Republican candidates uh, if you are registered um, as a Democrat or a Republican. Um, uh, in, in many other states, they, they have what are called open primaries, which is to say uh, anyone can vote um, for you know, their, their chosen candidates uh, uh, in, in, in any party. Um, here in Pennsylvania, we, we do not have that system again. So um, if you are trying to vote in the primary uh, and you are uh, not aligned, uh, which is to say you're registered as an independent or unaffiliated, um, uh, then you, you are not going to be able to participate in choosing the candidates from the Democratic or Republican parties. Um, now, you can change your registration online, again, up to 15 days before uh, um, any uh, 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 election. Um, I know several people who, um, uh, you know, were registered as independent or unaffiliated, but who did change their registrations in order to participate in either the Democratic or Republican primaries, who then changed their registrations back after the, after the fact. Um, however, um, in, in order to define, uh, you know, what a closed primary state means, it, it, it means that you can't participate in the primary if you're not registered in one of the two parties. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I, I know a lot of young voters might not understand that yet or, or not understand why we have the system that we have. Um, we changed a lot of things last fall uh, with Act 77. This was not one of them. <laughs> so I hope that answers your question, Councilwoman. It does, and I appreciate that just because I just feel like that is a space that folks are just a little unsure about. Um, again, since it doesn't really apply in the general, um, but we are doing, uh, you know, we are doing continuous uh, voter registration and trying to make sure folks are engaged. I do want to make bring it up um, for new registrants so that they understand what that means and, and that they don't come to May and be like, why can't I vote? Because 
I'm trying to avoid from getting those phone calls if I'm being fully transparent. So <laughs> <laughs> totally fair. And yeah, it doesn't matter what you're registered as you can vote uh, this November. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're registered as a Democrat, Republican, unaffiliated, independent, constitutionalist, whatever you want. Uh, you can vote this fall, but um, the closed primaries do, they limit your ability to participate in primary elections if you're not a Democrat or a Republican. Yes, so thank you. Um, so I don't see, um, I, don't, I have not seen any hands raised for questions. So um, you can also use our share additional resource connections or links you'd like everyone to know about and we'll share those out to all participants. So please send us those, that information and we'd be happy to share it out. Um, for our participants in Allegheny County, We'll share out a link, uh, we'll, we'll share out a sign up link to you all for a poll worker recruitment tele town hall tonight. Ooh, that's a tongue twister. At 7.30 PM featuring rep, rep, my sis rep, Summer Lee and executive Rich Fitzgerald. Um, so with that, those two announcements and information sharing, we will bring today's training session number one to a close. Please join us again a week from today, Wednesday, September 16, 2020, from noon to 1.30 for our next training, which will focus on safe vote at home strategies, plus ways that organizations and communities can support poll worker recruitment, featuring trainers from the Pennsylvania Department of State and Philadelphia's Committee of 70. Our recording of today's session will be available at the at the Pittsburgh City Paper website at pghcitypaper.com and on many of our partner organizations' websites. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you for all our presenters. Thank you for everybody that had anything with doing uh, with putting on today's production. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Please uh, tune in to Joe's series that is going to happen tomorrow, right, Joe? Um, and so we look forward to seeing you again next week. And, and Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks, folks.